Welcome to The Jay Martin Show. My name is Jay Martin, and my guest today is Dan Wilson, the CEO and director of First Mining Gold. Now, I wanted to have Dan on the show for some time and get an update on this project because, like many of you, I've followed Keith Newmeyer's career at First Majestic Silver for many years, and I know this was a company that he launched a few years ago with a new vision in the gold sector. Dan Wilton is the president and CEO, and he's very excited about what's to come. I hope you enjoy this interview with Dan. Here he is. All right, here I am with Dan Wilton, the CEO of First Mining Gold. Dan, thanks so much for making the time and chatting with me today. Jay, it's such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure's all mine. I'm looking forward to jumping into the details here and getting this story in front of my audience. Um, I'm excited about it for a handful of reasons that we'll get into. Prior to that, though, I wanted to just take a minute to pull on your background. I know you spent uh, about 24 years prior to First Mining Gold, you know, advising on M&A transactions to the tune of, I think, $10 billion in M&A activity and at least a billion dollars in, in financings. So, you know, I get this question all the time from our subscribers. What's our outlook for M&A activity in the sector? And I'd love to know yours. Yeah, well, listen, I think uh, we're at a very interesting time in the cycle in the mining sector where um, we uh, have what I think is the best setup for an M&A market that I've ever seen in my career. Hmm. And I've been doing this now for 30 years. Uh, and that setup is, is as follows. You have an industry that has systematically underinvested in its own productive capacity and longevity of its reserves really since 2011 so we are in you know what is essentially year 12 mm -hmm. of underinvestment in some cases sort of active disinvestment you've seen uh, you know increasing uh, or decreasing reserve grades and you're starting to see larger mining companies, you know, replacing their reserves on the back of increasing gold price assumptions or decreasing cut upgrades. That is something that is not sustainable. That leads by definition to increased cost in the environment. You're seeing the, the push up in all in sustaining cost. And a lot of that is old assets that had long lives that the lives get less long every day. Mm -hmm. And they're being pushed hard. Right. And that's where you really start seeing this cost increase coming in. Some of it's just factor cost increases, but a lot of it is you're sweating assets that get tougher every year. And that's by definition, like you're in an under uh, an open pit mine or an underground mine. It gets deeper every year. The mm -hmm. costs go up depending on, you know, if you're mining the same grade. So you've had this systematic underinvestment. You've had very little discovery for all that, you know, I'm sure the audience uh, can name their top 10, you know, favorite uh, discovery stories. And there've been some great ones, but on a, on a macro basis, there really have not been that many big world-class deposits discovered. Mm -hmm. And, and the time frame to develop things from exploration success to putting a shovel in a ground or on first production you know, that permitting time frame and development time frame is, has extended out over this past 12 years. You know, it's probably 50 to 70% longer than it used to be. You used to say, you know, discovery to first gold 10 years. Now it's very easily 15 and I think pushing up from 15. And, the, uh, and you know, we'll talk about the cost in that curve of discovery and the fact that most of the money really needs to be spent in understanding a resource up front. So on top of that, the macro setup looks like there have been, uh, you know, most of the producing mining companies are, while they're having cost inflation pressures, they're also this year realizing four to $500 more free cash flow per ounce than they were budgeting, right? Most of yeah. the capital budgets, operating budgets were done October, November, when the gold price, we'll recall, was on a dive down to 1600 People were panicking. A lot of them ran long-term budgets at fifteen or $1,600 gold. Well, it's been 1800 and above the entire year. You know, we're now sitting and people are panicking that it's pushed down to, you know, 1985. This is a pretty healthy gold market. Like, I remember when we used to dream about gold prices like this. <laughs> That is showing up and it's going to start showing up more aggressively as free cash flow margin in the producers. So 
just put those two facts together to those two facts together of systematic underinvestment, depleting resources, no new projects, no new discoveries, and you know, healthy cash flow that mm-hmm. you weren't expecting. Some of that'll get returned to shareholders, but some of that needs to get reinvested in longer mine lives and exploration in, in acquiring new development projects, resources in the ground, and productive capacity. And then you map on top of that the fact that particularly for the developer space where we operate, we are sitting at as low of valuations as I can recall seeing in the development space at any time in my career. So, you know, mm-hmm. the average developers, typically late stage developers should trade at 0.5 to 0.7 times their fundamental value NAV. Uh, you know, right now that average is 0.3 to 0.4. And you have a lot of examples of advanced stage developers, like First Mining Gold, for example, trading at 0.1. So mm-hmm. on top of that, with a gold price move, the producers have now actually seen a re-rating in their shares, right? Yeah. Cash yeah. flow, free cash flow margins are increasing. A lot of the producers are up, you know, 50, 75, 100% from their lows in, uh, in November last year. And so share prices are higher. Access to capital is good. Cash flow is good. They have a currency in some cases now that's in a very different position than it was a year ago, where they can use their shares to go buy projects, use their cash to go build projects, which is how this industry should work and how it's worked in most of the last 30 years that I've been involved in it. So again, from a, from a macro setup, i never had the alignment of such a disparity of available cash flow you know, well-financed producing companies, unfinanced development companies trading at, you know, all-time low valuation levels. So that is the perfect setup for M&A in the gold space. No doubt. Okay, now I, I need to ask, and it's it's maybe obvious, why does cash go to the big companies first? Why are the major gold producers seeing a, a 50%, 100% increase in share price? World's biggest streaming companies are as well. Um, capital always takes a bit of time to flow downstream to the advanced stage developers, early stage developers, and then eventually the highly, highly speculative stuff. But uh, is is that all that's going on right now, Dan, from your perspective? Are we watching the expected flow of capital enter the sector where it should in the most sort of tried, tested, and proven bets, the profitable ones, and then find their way down to look for some torque? once the easy returns have already been realized on the biggest companies? And is, is this is there anything amiss in this process that we've seen unfold so many times before? That's my question. We've yeah. seen this process unfold many times. Is there anything amiss this time that makes you think maybe it's different or this is now just a patient game? You know, I think the one thing that is different now is that typically, you know, that, that we are seeing exactly what we've seen in past cycles, which is producers because they have immediate leverage to gold price increases because they're selling gold every week or every month, however frequently they're pouring gold, um, they have that immediate leverage to the increase in the gold price because it turns into increased cash on the balance sheet, uh, increased free cash flow margin. So it is logical in a rising gold price environment, you always see the producers catch that first. What's different this time than in the past is that the last 11 or 12 years have really taken a lot of investors, particularly institutional investors, out of the development sector. And that's just because Mm -hmm. a lot of the investors have been able to get great returns on or good valuation levels buying producers. Remember, they were 50% lower, you know, uh, six to nine months ago. So you could buy a producer and on a risk return basis, if you're particularly if you're not a mining specialist investor, like you just want to buy something that gives you the exposure. And you know what? That's worked out pretty well. You know, in some cases, you're up 50 to 100% in the last six months. Um, it is it, historically, you had a group of uh, institutional investors in the mining space that would always have an eye on development projects and were generally the ones that funded advanced stage developers, you know, through to that construction decision. That's the part that's really changed is okay. over the last 10, 11 years, you haven't had, you've had a lot of outflows. A lot of those funds are a lot smaller than they used to be. 
And in this part of the cycle, a lot of those funds still aren't seeing inflows. And some of our institutional shareholders have had these discussions in the last few weeks. You know, gold price goes up over $2,000 and they're still not seeing the inflows into call it small cap gold funds. So they're still pretty much looking at the large cap. And, and, you know, we haven't had the gold price sustained at a level high enough that um, you're going to have the sustained return in the gold producers to uh, start what I would call the performance chasing, right? No one has looked back now over the last year and said, oh, well, you know, gold bullion, you know, I'm not, I don't quite believe it yet, but gold equities, you know, best performing sub-index of the TSX last quarter. You probably have to put two or three of those quarters in before you get real asset allocation into performance chasing, which is honestly, we all know how most asset allocators allocate. They are, you know, backward looking and they're chasing performance. So when that allocation starts coming in to, you know, institutional investors, they will have more leeway to be able to be making that trade-off decision of risk and return of buying junior producers, which they usually do first, right? They first, they buy Barrick and Newmont and then they go and buy the 100 to 200,000 ounce a year, you know, high torque junior producers, single asset producers. And then when those get to trade at one time, snap it above, then they start looking for the developers to give them more of that torque. So, yes. you know, but I think what's unique about this time is the developers are starting from such a low level mm. that there is a real opportunity for, you know, the, the average investor you know, high net worth or retail investor to be targeting some of these development stories at an earlier stage. Mm -hmm. And the difference, you know, the difference in a normal cycle, you just got to think between buying at 0.3 times NAV when it would trade to 0.5 and the opportunity to buy it today at 0.1 times NAV when it will trade to 0.5, if you Mm -hmm. believe in that re-rating, you know, that's the difference between not quite doubling your money and making 5x, right? You have the really interesting opportunity here by virtue of just a confluence of market factors that I think leaves this really, really compelling investment opportunity for the developer space. Now, listen, I'm biased. (laughs) I'm hugely invested in our own company, right? So (laughs) to a degree, I am talking my own book, uh, and I think everyone will recognize that. But again, this is based on you know, 30 years of experience with most of my career being either as a private equity investor or, or an M&A advisor. So, you yeah. know, it is, it is a really unique time in the sector for sure. You know, for what it's worth, if I have a company CEO on and they don't start talking their own book, that's a red flag to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, and, uh, it's all bought and paid for shares, right? Like this yeah. is, you know, I've been here for four years and uh, other than taking down a few RSUs, a lot of it was bought in financings or in the market, you know, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm the CEO, Keith Newmeyer, our chair, yeah. uh, owns multiples of what I do. And I think all of his were bought in the market a little bit in financings, but most of it, he's in the market, you know, quarter of a million shares, yeah. usually every quarter. And, you know, particularly at levels like this, he just keeps buying. So, yeah, that's, that's what I, that's what I love to hear. Just to touch on a couple of things you mentioned there you know, new capital flows come into the sector only because I, I just spoke with Randy Smallwood earlier, who just got back from a couple of weeks marketing in Europe and Asia. He said a full third of the meetings he took and the investors he met were new money coming to the sector. And so, you know, good indicators on that front. And what I would share at the VRIC, my conference in January in Vancouver, the number one question that I got on the show floor, and I've never had this before, was how do I get started? It was you know, some version of that question was, where do yeah, I start? Yeah. How do we get started? Who should I read? All of this stuff. But it was very, I, I don't want to call it, call it juvenile because the individuals I was talking to were not juvenile investors, but definitely new to the resource business. You yeah. know, maybe, you know, 30, early 30s, they, they dabbled in crypto and cannabis or just broad equities, you know, and whatever. Uh, but somehow they ended up at, at our show in January, yeah. which is a very focused, uh, you know, mining conference. Um, okay, I want to talk about first mining gold. So let's jump into this uh, great jurisdiction. A couple assets I want to touch on. Um, let's start in Ontario with Springpole, um, yep. one of the largest undeveloped open pit gold deposits in the country. 
Uh, yep. This is in Ontario. Um, walk me through what we're looking at there, please, Dan. Sure. So this is a project that uh, First Mining acquired in 2016. Uh, you know, we've been in the environmental assessment process since 2018, which is important because, again, uh, you know, the work that we have done really positions Springpole pretty uniquely when you're looking at developers in terms of being advanced in that process. That process is getting longer all the mm. time, and it's yeah. really expensive. And it's really complicated. Um, but, you know, I think we've got a great team that's moving it forward through that EA process to the point where we'll talk about this. But it's now, you know, we've got a pretty clear line of sight on submitting a final EA a year from now ish. And then, uh, and then, you know, that process should be another 12 months to environmental assessment approval. Um, so this is, you know, located in a great jurisdiction it's about 100 kilometers east of red lake ontario so in the area of northwestern ontario close to the manitoba border um you know access to infrastructure there's uh forestry roads that go on to our mineral tenure about 18 kilometers from the project uh there's power lines about 30 kilometers away and then a bigger almost brand newly built 230 kv power line you know 70 to 80 kilometers away so lots of access to power which is important uh and i think you know it represents a really good opportunity to drive infrastructure into a region of northwestern ontario that can open up a lot of other opportunities and that's part of the reason why we have such the great support that we do from the province of ontario and in, in uh, moving the project you know through the ea process so we put out a pre-feasibility study so take a step back it's uh 4.6 million ounces of measured and indicated resource uh, of gold. Um, you know, it's another 24 million ounces MI resource of silver. Uh, and the silver recovers in this project. So it's a helpful byproduct. Um, and again, we had scoped it in 2021 as a large uh, open pit, average grade about one gram gold and five gram silver. It produced for an 11 year mine life and be capable of producing you know, in the core years uh, of its mine life, an average of in excess of 300,000 ounces a year. So this is big enough to be meaningful to the biggest mining companies in the world. Um, yeah. And in terms of development process, we had a pre-feasibility study done uh, early in 2021, which showed net present value at a $1,600 gold price of just shy of a billion dollars US on 718 million US of uh, upfront capital cost. Okay. Um, those costs will have increased and we'll talk about you know part of the reason why people are avoiding developers is taking on capital cost exposure in a, an inflationary environment can be tricky right that's something that you really need to understand i think there's lots of ways that that can be managed and mitigated we can talk a bit about that too but uh we've been uh, since 2021 moving the project through the feasibility study process we're about 90 percent done that process now including, you know, understanding uh, feasibility level, metallurgical variability testing, um, hydrogeology, hydrology, waste rock characterization, geochemistry, uh, you know, tailings dam structures and uh, tailings uh, deposition strategy, uh, you know, where uh, the mine plan and the process flow sheet and the, and the plant sizing and everything else is, is basically done to feasibility levels. So, um, you know, we're well advanced on that front. And then the other real driver of time frame here is the environmental assessment process. So at Springpole, we uh, submitted uh, and published a draft environmental assessment about a year ago. So that just lays out in a comprehensive fashion, 10,000 pages, all the baseline studies and work that we've been doing at this project really since 2010. Uh, the summary of those and then a game plan to be able to build the mine with no long-term adverse impacts to the environment. So, um, you know, one of the things about Spring Pole, the deposit sits under the Bay of a Lake. And so the development plan involves building less than a kilometer of dikes, dewatering the lake and having, having uh, uh, dewatering this Bay of the Lake and having an open pit uh, mining project. Um, that for a lot of people is taking a lot of getting their heads around but you know i think the reality is uh it's been done a number of times before in canada um 
what we are facing from a technical perspective is a lot less challenging than a lot of the mines in the Northwest Territories or Nunavut, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're very confident in being able to get through that. But it's, you know, it's one of those things that I think has been a perception issue that's kind of uh, <laughs> had some investors stay on the sidelines. I think you can look at this now with the engineering work done and with the EA work done and get confident that there's nothing here that's... Uh, that's a fatal flaw of the project. So, um, like I said, that we we uh, published that uh, May June last year. That's now been reviewed by all of the regulatory agencies. Uh, we've got over twelve hundred comments back from all of the agencies, okay. and we've now responded to most of those twelve hundred comments. So, this is the stuff that typically mm-hmm. happens after you submit your final EA. And this yeah. is what people say, oh, this is going to drag out the, the time frame for, the, for, you know, ultimately that permitting process. We're kind of getting all that done and you get the buy-in before we submit the final. So that mm-hmm. when you submit that final EA, you have a lot clearer picture because everyone has reviewed it. You've discussed all the critical issues. So, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're excited, really starting to write up that final EA now, aim mm-hmm. to submit that about a year from now. Yeah, and uh, ultimately targeting that EA approval in 2025. Ultimately targeting that EA approval in 2025. And then, yeah, best case scenario here. Um, right now, you're looking at around an 11-year mine life. The, the good years, maybe year one through nine, I think I saw was yep. forecasted about 335,000 ounces per year of gold. Um, the next big milestone is submitting that final EA. Is there anything in, is that correct? I, yes. Although there's, there's a lot of little milestones along the way to the big milestone. Great. That's what I'm after. Yeah. Like in terms of news flow. Yeah. So, um, importantly, you know, one of the other things we've done is pick up, uh, really a district scale exploration package in the Bertucci Greenstone belt beside the project. So we're starting to, to develop, uh, and test a few exploration opportunities up there, really to demonstrate that, you know, spring pole as one deposit is quite, is, you know, from a footprint perspective is quite small. It's a kilometer long and, mm. you know, 350 meters wide. Um, but we've got 70,000 hectares of prospective greenstone belt around it that, you know, want to demonstrate you will be exploring and finding gold here for generations. So there's some of that that, you know, we put out a couple of news releases about our work in the fall. There's some work in the winter that we should have some results out on in the not too distant future. And then another really important milestone for us is how we're working with uh, the indigenous communities around the project. Uh, And we've committed to a process with the communities uh, where they are doing their own uh, indigenous led assessment. And that kind of runs in parallel with the EA. We're just scoping that out now. But we're hopeful that manifests itself in a few agreements uh, with communities that come as we advance in that process. And ultimately, you know, it's important for us to have the, uh, the consent of the communities that we're working with uh, and ultimately that we would love to have as our partners moving this project forward. So that's yeah. another area that I think there's, there's a bunch of little milestones. They're really difficult to predict from a timing perspective. But a bunch of milestones on that front uh, that I think can just, you know, really take, uh, give investors a, a sense of the progress. It's not just hitting that one final document, right? There's a lot of things that go in on the way. And so one of the other things that we're looking at is potentially putting on an updated pre-feasibility study uh, that just is the final scope that we're going to take into the final EA and just demonstrate that having come through, uh, you know, an inflationary environment or being in an inflationary environment, that with the project scope that we're taking into that final EA, uh, this is still a big and robust project that, you know, is, uh, is going to present very well versus a number of other ones. And, and ultimately, when people see it's big, it's robust. And by the way, it's kind of the next project to get permitted in Ontario, the next big project. And the next closest comparable is probably a few years behind us in the permitting process. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it helps position it strategically coming into that M&A market that we were talking about before. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's, um, let's jump uh, across the border to Quebec. Um, 
the Deep Parquet project in the Abitibi region. Uh, where do you want to start here, Dan? What do you want to share? Yeah, um, so yeah. we'll I'll start just, uh, you know, this is a project that we've been a part owner of since 2016, when First Mining bought a company called Clifton Star that had yeah. optioned the project, uh, earned into 10% of the companies that owned the project. And then in the downturn in 20, you know, 2013 to 2016, which was pretty savage, uh, you know, they weren't able to fulfill their earn-in commitment and the project went back to the original partner. So we've always been a small partner in this, really like the opportunity. It's a big resource. You know, this is 5 million ounces plus uh, sitting in the middle of the Abitibi gold belt, you know, one of the most prolific gold belts in the world, um, close to uh, major infrastructure, you know, like uh, highways and power, you know, there's a mining town right beside the project that was built in the 1930s to service the original mine, you know, three past producing mines on our, on our property. Um, but ultimately looking at it as a big open pit, we've got three and a half million ounces of uh, M and I resource, another million and a half of inferred. And we think that's really just the starting point at Duparquet. So we acquired this project last year for a total of about $25 million, uh, $15 million in our stock and about $10 million in cash. And for the first time really since the mid-1950s, <laughs> this project is now consolidated in ownership in the hands of one group to move it forward. So we're very, very excited about this. I think it's a, it's a, it's a massive strategic resource. Mm. Uh, we think we have a lot of ability to grow it and actually have just, uh, are in the process of mobilizing, hope to have drills turning at Duparquet in the next couple of weeks. Okay. So that'll give us some things to look forward to kind of as we round the corner end of June coming into the summer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're also reasonably advanced on a PEA study just to get a snapshot of what we think this project can be, um, and there's been a lot of really good trade-off work we've done so far. And can you look at start starting smaller and expanding? Uh, do you look at starting, you know, in something that's a larger size? Because there's a hundred million ton resource here today. You know, this is uh, in one of the biggest undeveloped gold resources in Quebec, um, and certainly in that southern part of the Abitibi. You know. On the Quebec side, certainly one of the biggest resources not already owned by Agnico. So, um, yeah, right. you know, it is in the middle of a really, really core strategic area for them. So uh, I think we want to demonstrate that we can continue to grow it. I think we want to demonstrate that there's a viable path to move it forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, people are going to come to realize, you know, on an NPV basis, we think that this is worth, you know, multiples and multiples of what we paid for. It. Okay. Yeah, I like the optionality that you've built into the company. And um, and actually with that, I know as part of the acquisition of the um, Duparquet, you were able to sell an encore asset recently, um, uh, the Eagle asset, I believe, correct? And it's Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that was, you know, it's uh, it's amazing sometimes what you find as you, uh, as you go through the books of the things that you've, <laughs> you've picked up. That was a project that, you know, it's, uh, we knew it was a, a long tenured land holding that had some work done on it in the 70s and 80s, uh, some base metal showings in a great location, just, uh, you know, about 150 kilometers from Winnipeg. Um, but happens to be in an area where our new partner Grid Metals is doing a lot of great exploration work for lithium and happens to be right beside one of the few actual producing lithium mines in Canada. So, mm. um, you know, great area that they were going to do some work. And obviously we have our hands full with a bunch of other projects. So um, happy to get it into their hands, take some shares for ongoing exposure and a royalty and you know, yeah. wish them all the greatest success uh, to move the project forward because it was something that we were never going to get to given what we have on our plate. So, no, that that whole working the other assets in the portfolio has been a big job of ours in the last couple of years. When you look at, you know, we brought a partner into Pickle Crow uh, in northwestern Ontario. We still own 30% of the project, 20% mm -hmm. carried to a construction decision. Uh, but Pickle Crow you know, one of Canada's now largest and highest grade underground mines. Uh, 
you know, past producer produced at 16 grams for 30 years, uh, you know, tons of infrastructure in the area and a great place to be moving it forward with a, our partner at Teco is a great and very talented exploration team. So, mm. you know, that's that alone you know, that today's price is worth, you know, 20 or $30 million just on that one project interest. Mm. And it's great because we're in a carried position. We benefit from all the resource growth. They've grown the resources there from a million ounces to, I think they're 2.4 now. And they're just starting to step out into, into the sort of regional exploration that think you could add, you know, uh, it could add multiples to that. So, um, you know, really exciting high grade gold area. We, you know, but again, that's uh, us finding partners to spend the money advancing our project. So between that, uh, our Hope Brook project that uh, Big Ridge Gold is advancing and Treasury Metals, where we're just a 15% shareholder, but we yeah. already distributed 20% of that company out directly to our shareholders in 2021. Um, you know, those three companies combined will have spent probably, I don't know, 60 or $70 million advancing those projects over the last two or three years. And we still have interest in all of them that we haven't had to fund, right? We've concentrated mm -hmm. our funding on advancing really the world-class size and scale projects at Spring Pole and acquiring Duparquet. So, well, it, yeah. yeah, and I think shareholders appreciate the optionality. Uh, and, you know, even with the Eagle Asset, for example, you, you know, you kept the 2% the royalty and I think there's a, a bonus payment at some point, put some non-dilutive cash in the treasury. You've got these JV yeah. projects, but we know where the core focus is, really what to watch, right? Yeah. And um, and and also very disciplined with that. Um, okay, I want to leave it at this today. I think um, you know what we should look forward to is you know we could talk about you know expansion of the asset um, at Pickle Crow, but I'd I'd probably say um, more significantly we're looking at uh, drill results at some point this summer from Du Parquet. and um, and then as you mentioned the mini milestones along the way to the bigger milestone up at Spring Pool. Um, yeah, not to mention, you know, at least one and maybe two major economic studies coming out on world class size projects over the course of the next six months, right? So, uh, yes. you know, I think it just will be able to demonstrate that even in this inflationary environment, and we've got these projects that are economic at, you know, at a lower gold price than we're going to, than, than we're seeing today. But the other important thing, Jay, and it's so important to understand about the value of these big projects is the leverage that they have to a rise in gold price. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. at Spring Pole in our pre-feasibility study, every hundred dollars on the gold price was two hundred and fifty million dollars of after-tax NPV or pre-tax NPV. Sorry, one hundred and fifty million of after-tax NPV. So basically, every hundred dollars is our market cap, more than our market cap today, mm. it's considerably more than our market mm. cap in NPV increase. So if you are an investor, again, looking for that leverage play, A, you're buying dollars for dimes, right? At the outset, because there is established NPV, there's established projects, established resources that can grow, but the ones that are there, you're buying, you know, at 0.1 times their fundamental value. Mm -hmm. And then the leverage that that overall fundamental value has two increases in gold price. You know, if you have a bullish view gold and you want to get torque, like the developers are the place to play that right now. I agree. I agree, Dan. Okay. Hey, I want to thank you for coming on the show and chatting with me and getting this story in front of my audience, letting me pull some, pull on some threads with you today. No, it's great. I really appreciate it. And uh, if anyone looking for more information, our website's a great place to start www.firstmininggold.com or reach out uh, the info at firstmininggold.com and we'll be sure to get back to you. We'll have those details beneath this piece of content for anybody who wants to take a look. All right. Thanks again, Dan. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Jay.